I want you to turn with me in your Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Genesis 2 and verse number 8. You need to remember, too, as you study the Bible, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. So many things start here, and then the theme is carried throughout the Scripture. But what you get here is what's called the law of first mention. And the law of first mention is a good... Uh, it's a good thing to study the Bible by. Uh, in other words, uh, the first time it's mentioned in Scripture, look at the context, how it's used, where it's located, and you'll find that the Bible then continues on with that throughout Scripture. If you look at chapter number 2 of Genesis, down verse number 8, the Bible says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he'd formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Good. Lord bless this holy book now. Good. Wow. Me unction to preach it. In your name I pray, amen. 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 I will confess to you this morning that my heart and my spiritual condition has been touched in such a fashion the last few days it hadn't been in a long time. And so it is with great uh, uh, duress, and I don't think I'm pushing the word, that uh, I preach this message to you today. And may God use it for whatever purpose he intends to use it. For it's not me, it's the word. You're begotten by the word. The man that uh, preached and you were saved under his ministry who wound up being one of the worst profligates that ever walked the face of this earth, still does not change the fact that you're begotten by the word, not by the man. But the scripture talks about Eden. There's two gardens I'm going to preach to you about this morning. I'm going to preach about Eden and Gethsemane. There's another garden over there in the Song of Solomon. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, with the bride and with, uh, and with her love. But I'm not going to get into that today for the sake of time. And the volume of the material needs to be covered but what I want to talk to you about this morning is the reason God put you here. Here's the reason. The Bible said God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The wording's important. He made his body from dirt. He breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Some things are said about man that's not said about anything else. First of all, God breathed into that man. That meant that something, something came up from inside God. It came up from him and went into the man. Therefore, God put something in the man that he did not put in anything else on this earth. The scripture says man became a living soul. If you do a little research in the Bible, I think you might find that it nowhere says that angels have souls. Think about that for a moment. Because it is with the soul that you commune with God. The reason you do is because it is from God you receive your soul and you, you return into his soul. And there's a place in the heart of God and the soul of God that only a man can speak to and can touch and can reside in. And that's what this is about, folks. It's not about right and wrong. Do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. You can get into the letter of the law and you can carry that burden till you die and never have fellowship with God. That's not to put it down, to denigrate what's right and wrong, not at all, but put them in the right place. Everything must be in its right place. First place is your relationship with God. And your relationship with God is not built on what you do. It's built on who you are and who he is to you and who you are to him. That's the most wonderful thing that you can have in this world. And that is the relationship with him. The Bible says in the Garden of Eden, the word Eden means delight. In the Garden of Delight. This is where it all started, folks. Keep in mind that when God made Adam, he put him in a garden to dress it and to keep it. He wanted communion with him. For the Bible said they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Chapter 3 and verse number 8. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Oh, how much it cost them when they had sinned against the Lord. Heaven is a place, my dear friend. Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl and all of that. That's one thing. But my dear friend, that's not communion with God. Heaven will be a place where you will know God in a sense you've never known him here. 
You'll live in his heart, and he'll live in your heart in a way that you've never known him. Wouldn't it be something, wouldn't it be wonderful if God began to reveal his mind to you? Wouldn't that be something if in the heart of God, walking in his very soul, he in your soul, you in his soul, that the mind of God begins to open up to you and the very heart of the creator? My friend, that's heaven. Make no mistake about it. That's a place that I desire to see one day and go to according to the scriptures. But that's what awaits you. It awaits you. The apostle said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. Noah, Daniel, and Job are mentioned in the Bible as three individuals whose righteousness is called forth for you to understand. Noah, Daniel, and Job. We had a lot of other righteous men. I mean, look at Moses and the rest of them, David and so forth. But not them. They're not included in these three. Why? Righteousness in the Old Testament has to do with right standing with God. Yeah. It has to do with the mind of God, the holiness of God, the spirit of God, the will of God. And my friend, that's what's important for us today. Did you know that your, jo that your soul is intellect, emotion, and will? Do you understand that? Do you realize how important your will is? We call it volition. Choices that you make. You make them every day. You made choices today. That's why you're in this house this morning. You made choices. You choose. Choose you this day. You're not an automaton. You're not, a, you're not an AI a robot. You're not something that's been made to, to serve man. No, 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 no. God made you for himself. And the more you know of him, the more you're going to rejoice. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. The Bible said in the book of Psalm 103 that the ways of God were revealed to Moses. And the children of Israel saw his acts. They saw what he was doing, but Moses began to realize why he was doing it, where it was going to be done. These are the kind of things that give meaning to life, doesn't it? I mean, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. The towers fall on the good and they fall on the bad. Amen. I mean, if all you judge your life by is all the junk you see around you, I don't blame you for being despondent and full of depression today and have no desire to live. You've got to be able to see through it and see past it and see a reason, a purpose, something higher than what you're living in. The Bible said in Exodus chapter number 33, verse 13, Moses said, Lord, show me thy way. I want to know your way. That's a wise man. Because he's leading the children of Israel. They've been in bondage 400 years. They've been slaves. They didn't know anything. All they knew was to serve Pharaoh. Pharaoh's slaves. Oh, wasn't Pharaoh great? I went to Egypt one time and saw a huge statue to Ramses. It was inside a building. And we stood up on the second tier and walked around and looked down at this huge, I mean, I'm telling you folks, 60, 70 feet long, something like that, of Ramses. Where's Ramses now? Yeah. Amen. Where are the kingdoms of the world? Where are they? Where are they now? They're gone. They're in the dust pile of history. But that Lord Jesus Christ that lived 2,000 years ago, he's more alive every day in your soul than you could ever know. The Bible said in Psalm 25 and verse number 4, Show me thy ways, Lord. I want to know your way. The Bible said in Romans 11, verse number 33, the ways of the Lord are past finding out. Yeah. The Bible said, search me and know me and try me. You know something, folks? Canst thou by searching find out God? Can't find him. Don't know where to look for him. He has to come to you and reveal himself to you. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 20 and verse number 21, a remarkable thing happened. They were brought out of Egypt, been there 400 years. And now they're facing a real God. Yeah. Not the gods of the Egyptians, a bunch of demons. Right. Created in the image of man. Yeah. Man creates them in his own image and his nightmares and, and his demon possession. He, cry, he, he carves out his gods in wood and stone. Yeah. But now they're about to come face to face with a real God. Yeah. Amen. The God that judged all their gods. Right. They're about to come face to face right. with him. You know what he did? He came down upon that mountain in thick darkness. Thick darkness. Thick darkness. The Bible said in Genesis 1, And there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Darkness. And he said, Let there be light. That's not the sun. That's a greater light than the sun. That's a light, my dear friend, that came forth from the command of God. Has he ever had that light shine in your soul? 
Those Brits over there sing a song, Lord, shine on, let the light shine on me. You ought to tune it in. You ought to get on YouTube and type in uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London. Lord, shine on me and listen to that. That's a beautiful thing. British, the English people are singing that. And I swear I'm telling you, I've been singing along with them. Amen. <laughs> I really like that song. They got a lot of good ones, though, not just that one. It's awful to be in darkness, isn't it? Went in the cave one time. The guide took us back. He said, now, he said, raise your hand up. And I raised it up. He said, can you see it? No. That's total darkness. How many's ever been there? I'm talking about total darkness. Did you know something? A man can't stand that. They've already done enough psychological uh, evaluations of it. You get into total darkness, and he's going to go off the deep end. Nothing to relate to, nothing to see, nothing to understand. Total, absolute darkness. But my dear friend, without God, that's all there is. Total darkness. So it settles down upon the mountain. And here's Moses. He's the one that's been called forth. And this darkness was thick. You couldn't see, no, you couldn't see anything but the darkness. And he walked into it. Well, that takes courage. He walked into that darkness. He walked right into it. Walked into that darkness. And he came out with the tables of stone. The Ten Commandments. Yeah, 40 days. On top of that mountain. In the thick darkness. I read the Bible says in Exodus chapter number 20 verse 21. That he drew near unto God. He drew near unto him. And he went into the thick darkness. There's only one Moses, ever has been, ever will be. Just one. One Moses. You know, it's awful dark at Gethsemane, don't you think? When the Lord Jesus Christ walked into it. Here's what it says in John chapter number 20 and verse 20. And when he had said, he showed unto them his hands, his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They said to Jesus, and, and, then, and then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me. Even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted to them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. My, that's almost like breathing into their nostrils a breath of life and the becoming living souls. It's amazing how personal God gets with us when he breathed on them. Well, you say, that was Pentecost. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that was light years above Pentecost. This is an entirely different thing for an entirely different purpose. This is an anointing and an unction from on high that can only come from God. If you ever had the Holy Ghost move on your soul and breathe into you and move you toward the light, have you ever had that happen? Move you toward the light. Wasn't that a wonderful day? He led you. He led you. <laughs> He moved you toward the light. And here you go. And you're like a child. and a, You know, you, you don't know what to expect. But you, you can't stop. Because that light keeps drawing you. It's dark in this world. And they live in darkness. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. And he calls me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. Lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy to these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Behold, watch this, I will cause my breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Dry bones, but the breath is where their life came from. Why, well, yeah, he didn't breathe onto plants. He didn't breathe into animals, but he, bro he, he breathed into the man. Dry bones, the breath of God, brought them out of darkness and death. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 42 and verse 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. You know who's talking here? That's God. Yeah. He just said he had a soul. Yeah. God's got a soul, intellect, emotion, and will. Yeah. The soul is a spiritual entity, yes, but it is not the spirit. 
It is a spirit world, yes. The soul is not subject to physical carnal death. But the soul is who you are. You're listening to me today, right now. Your soul is taking the words that I'm preaching to you. And you're considering them. Your will, your intellect, your emotion. You can respond. You can think. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Thick darkness. I looked up that thick. What does that mean? Why not just darkness? No, no, no. This was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And he walked into it. The Bible said he stretched forth his hand toward heaven. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days, and the people were stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Look at that. The Egyptians were scared to death. You see, this is what happens when their gods begin to fall around them. This world's full of them. You live in a generation of ignorance today, folks. I mean, ignorance on steroids, believe me. They are ignorant. They are, they are ignorant as you can be. When it comes to spiritual things, the things of God, there's a darkness out there, but the darkness can come into your life. The darkness can come in such a way, and why does it do that? Because God's in the darkness, that's why. He's in it. The Bible said here in the book of 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 9, there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priest were come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And Solomon said, the Lord said he would dwell in the thick darkness. There's a lot of difference between those priests and Moses. Amen. When the Amen. darkness showed up, they ran. When the darkness showed up, Moses walked into it. Amen. Big difference. Oh, yes. Big difference. And you can make that choice today because it's going to get dark. I've been in darkness. God knows. Amen. Where's the Lord? He's in the darkness. That's where he is. <laughs> That's where he is. He's in the thick darkness. He's where you can't see him. You can't feel him. You can't touch him. You can't hear him. But if you walk in there, he'll find you. He's in the darkness. He's in the darkness. <laughs> the Bible said these words, the Lord spake to all your assembly in the mount of the midst of the fire of cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them tables of stone and delivered them. One of the things about thick darkness is that you feel lost, or you are lost. Did you know that a sheep of all the animals on this earth has no sense of direction? None, none. You can take a sheep a couple of hills over from where its flock is grazing, and it's lost. It can't find its way back. It can't even find something to eat. Once it has eaten everything around it, it can't find. It must have human direction. In this case, the direction of God. Don't run from the darkness. Don't hide in the darkness. Walk in the darkness. And he'll meet you. He'll meet you. God must manifest himself. He's got to make himself known to you. How does he do that? Well, he made himself known 2,000 years ago when God showed up in flesh. If you don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh, you're not a Christian. You may be religious, good moral person. You may be fine in your community, but you don't know him. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty, incarnate in flesh. That's who he is. That's who he is. He's light. You understand that in that darkness, there's nothing without him? You realize the spiritual world, the condition of this spiritual world today, they're dark. It's midnight. Anything goes out there. And when anything goes, nothing goes. When everything is true, there is no truth. You understand that principle? Some of you are going into darkness and some of you are coming out of it. Did it do you any good? Did you find him in there? 
When you went into the darkness, he was there. You see, you'll learn things in the darkness you'll never learn anywhere else. You got to go through it. You don't grow on the mountain, you grow in the valley. You got to go through these times. You got to go through the times when your heart's broken. You get on your face and bawl your eyes out. Just tear you all to pieces. I never thought in my life that I could see the thing that I'm going through now. Rip my heart out of my soul. God. So what do you do? Quit? Run off somewhere and lick your wounds? Cry for the rest of your life? No. You say, Lord, you're in that darkness. You're in there. I'm not leaving here until I find you. You find me. And I don't plan to come out of here the same as I did when I went in. Amen. How am I, your pastor, going to get up here and minister to you and preach to you if I don't live in the same world you live in? If I don't go through what you go through? Of course I do. And I'm no superman, <laughs> and I'm no super Christian, and I am no great man of faith. But there's something deep, deep down inside my soul that just despises quitting. That's just the way I'm made. I despise it. I despise it. I just, I just, I just, it just goes against everything in my fabric. So what do I do? I get back on my face, start pouring my heart out, and say, Lord, you've got your time, you've got your way, you've got your message, you've got your person, purpose. You know all these things. You don't have to tell me because I know you. You remember what Jonah said? You remember what Jonah said when, the, when, the, when he went over there to Nineveh and he preached to them in Nineveh? You know what he said to the Lord? He said, I know you. I knew what you were going to do. Yeah. Amen. 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 So that's why I went the other way. Yeah. They're our enemy. That's the capital of Assyria. I know you. God said, that's all right you do, don't you, Jonah? Yeah. Well, I know him. <laughs> yes, I do. I know him. Yeah. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Yeah. I know him. He will do right. He can't do anything but right. Yeah. But he doesn't have to explain it to me. I just have to find my way around in the thick darkness. Remember now, when Moses went into that darkness and up to that mountain at Sinai, he went up there and he saw the glory of God. But he first went into the darkness. Then he saw the glory. <laughs> it's all right to get a little glory every once in a while, don't you think? Feed your soul. <laughs> Amen. But keep this in mind. He said, I dwell in the thick darkness. So, nothing, nothing, nothing without him. Where was he? Where is he? Well, here's the thing about it. Right now, there are times when you don't know where he is, but you know who he is. If you know who he is, where he is will take its time and its place. Are you following me? Do you know the character of God? I know his character. He won't fail you. He can't lie. He's the Lord. He's a good God. I know that. Nobody's got to prove that to me. But here's a lot of things that God does. He doesn't explain to me. Yeah, as I've said to you many times, you'd be amazed the stuff God does and doesn't say a word to me about it. Yeah. Amen. I wish I would that some of these in self-inflated egotists, that, uh, narcissists that are uh, up at preaching to people, I wish they'd get a hold of that. And you say, preacher, what would God do without you? Oh, you're kidding. You're kidding. You're really kidding. <laughs> what would I do without him? Amen. Darkness on the face of the deep. And then we come to Gethsemane. And I'll preach here just a minute with you. Gethsemane means olive press. You know what's interesting? That when the Lord started his ministry, he started it by turning grapes into what? Wine. Water into wine. When he finished his ministry, it was at a tree with an olive being pressed. And olive oil is a type of life. 
It's the type of the, it's the type of the, type of the tree of life. Olive is used throughout all the Bible. It's amazing. How these little coincidences come. But so what is Gethsemane really about? It's about intercession. That's what it's about. It's about intercession. If you find a church, they're climbing the walls and shouting the house down. And, you know, they got the biggest and the best and this and that and all this and that and this and that. If they're not praying for each other, they're playing. First of all, they don't know the value of prayer. And if they're not praying for each other, they don't care anything about each other. Really don't. Intercessory prayer is a mark of true spirituality and maturity and growth in the Lord. Amen. You see, that's what I've been on my face in the last few days. Let me tell you something about it. You don't know what you think or what you believe until something slaps you in the face. Then you'll know. And that's a good thing. How many's ever had something come out of the clear blue and slap you in the face? So how did you react? Did, you, did, did, it, did it touch something inside you that you weren't even sure about? Did it move you in the right direction? That's what it's supposed to do. He prayed. <laughs> Here's the way the writer said it. Beautiful old song. He said, Neath the stars of the night walk the Savior of light in the garden of dew-laden breeze. Where no light could be found, Jesus knelt on the ground. There he prayed neath the old olive trees. All the sin of the world on the Savior was hurled as he knelt in the garden alone. Hear his soul burden plea, let this cup pass from me. Even so, not my will, thine be done. Amen. May my song ever be of the love proffered me by my Lord all alone on his knees. Praise his wonderful name. He who bore all my blame as he knelt neath the old olive trees. And the chorus goes, neath the old olive trees, neath the old olive trees, went the Savior alone on his knees. Not my will, thine be done, cried the Father's own Son as he knelt neath the old olive trees. <laughs> I've been to what they call Gethsemane, been all over it. And uh, they're not 100% sure that it's Gethsemane, but they're about 99.9% .9 sure. Because the trees there are huge olive trees. Olive trees are a slow-growing tree. And you can stand at Gethsemane and look up and see the eastern gate right there from Gethsemane. You can see it. Look right up and see the eastern gate where he's coming through in the book of Ezekiel. He, beautiful. Moses said, take my name out of your book. That's an intercessor. You did. Take my name out. If you're, going to, if you're going to condemn them, just write me off too. Daniel said, here's what he said. David said, I'm going to turn them over to you, Lord. I'll let you decide what happens to them. Abraham said, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? He knew him. You see, God said this about Abraham. I know him. He said it about Abraham. He said, he'll direct his house. I know him. You know what that meant? I trust him. You know what that meant? I opened doors for him. That's what it meant. Well, Abraham knew him. I know the judge of the whole earth will do right. Daniel was on his face crying out for Israel. You know what God did? He gave him, his, he gave him the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. When the Holy Ghost stands in the gap for you, Romans chapter 8, verse number 26, he intercedes for you. I would that you get this past Wednesday night's message because I covered that in detail. I talked about it. It's very important to understand that he intercedes with you with groanings which cannot be uttered. Groanings. Look up that word groanings. And why does he do it? Because we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The Holy Spirit is making intercession for us. Doesn't that, uh, doesn't that humble you to understand that you think you know your needs and you really don't know them? Well, you have the Holy Spirit interceding for you to the, whole, to the Lord Jesus who turns around and intercedes for you to the Father. And then the Father sends forth the answer. Yeah. Intercession. That's why I'm here today because God has interceded for me. God speaks to God on my behalf. Isn't that something? God speaks to God on my behalf. Amen. That's quite a thing. And it just comes. He gives me what I need. Sometimes he has God ever given you something you need you didn't ask for? Raise your hand. 
Everybody raise your hand. Everybody be honest. You're the house of God anyway. <laughs> Tell truth in here. He has given you what you didn't need out of his goodness and his grace. But on the other hand, you might have really needed it and just didn't know it. That's God. That's, that's the Lord. That's the Lord I serve. If God be for us, who can be against us? Christ intercedes at the right hand of the Father. What does that mean? It means that he's in a position of authority. He's at his right hand. He earned that right. Christ said to Peter, he said, Peter, I've prayed for you. Oh, boy. <laughs> Get a hold of that for a minute. <laughs> Why? Because a spiritual battle was going on that Peter didn't know anything about. That's what that's about. If we really understood the battle that rages right now, the weapons that are arrayed against us, folks, it, we'd run. How many's ever seen a dog tuck its tail between its legs? City dwellers probably never seen that. But I'm going to tell you right now, when a dog tucks its tail between its legs and they start running, that's quite a sight. Yeah. It is. It's quite a sight. You mean a dog's not a human? No, it's not. Sorry to disappoint you. There's a difference. <laughs> Peter, I prayed for you. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. His head was turned into water. He said, tears flowed for Israel. Then Ezekiel in the battle, Ezekiel, Ezekiel at the, at the uh, valley of dry bones, he cried out for Israel. One man, one man. Prophesy, Ezekiel. Well, God could have done it without Ezekiel. But he has a reason for you. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. Why? Because you're in the heart of God and God's in your heart. Why? The breath that God breathed into you is still in you and he breathed back into him by the Holy Ghost of God. It's that prayer that comes forth from you. Think about it for a moment. You pray. You talk to the Lord. Here's another one. Does it say anywhere in the Bible that angels pray? No, nowhere, nowhere, can't find it, it's not in the Bible, but you do, that's a precious gift, and then finally Samuel, one of my heroes in the Bible, one of the greatest men that ever lived on this earth, Samuel was the, uh, the last and greatest of the uh, judges, Samuel the prophet, you know what he did, he had a million men out here ready to take Israel, he took a sucking lamb, and offered it up as a sacrifice unto God. A little lamb and its blood defeated that army. God does things in a strange way, doesn't he? He really does. He, he doesn't have to think like we think. There's somebody in this house today, all you got to do is walk down here and say, Lord, I'm in a mess. I don't understand a thing about what's happening. I don't know, but I know this. I know you're the Lord, and I know you make no mistakes. And I know the answer is going to come. It may not come when or how I want it to come. But the answer is going to come. Lord, I'm in the darkness. Find me. Find me. Father, bless your word. There's somebody in this house this morning, Lord. They want what I'm talking about. They do. They do. Don't let the evil one. Don't let the wicked one rob them, Father, of victory today, their joy and the power. Bless them. Bless them in your word. May it take root in their heart. May they grasp it. May they take hold of it like a life preserver and not turn it loose. In Jesus' name.